Welcome to the Future of Creator Economy, where we dive into the topics and issues that really matter to creators. Let's get started. Welcome to the Future Belongs to Creators, everybody. This is the show about the creator economy, and I'm really excited about today's guest. We have been like Twitter friends for a long time, and we've had like one call before, and I like just personally am excited to dig in and learn more about her business, quite frankly. We have Marie Poulan here. She is a Notion expert. She teaches people how to keep their life organized, essentially. Uh, through using Notion and we're going to dive in on her business today which is doing uh, I think it's like 40,000 per month uh, is what we reported in our case study which is fucking fantastic so yeah nice to have you here today Marie. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me yeah I'm excited to finally do this. Yeah well let's get started with our usual kickoff of have you heard and uh, Miguel I forgot to mention that you were here also so Miguel do you want to kick us off? <laughs> Hi, I'm here. Um, yeah, so I'll kick us off. Uh, I'm going to talk about Instagram today. So um, some of you may have noticed uh, that uh, Instagram uh, has this little feature, the little shop feature, which is a little tab where, mm -hmm. you know, you can kind of look at uh, different uh, stores and based on the, your likes and everything like that, they serve you up things that you hopefully will buy. And, you know, Meta gets a little cut of that revenue, of course. Um, well, apparently it's not going so well. Um, in other apps like uh, TikTok and um, like WeChat in China, for example, lots of money is being made within these social apps and people shopping on them, but it's just not going as well for, for Meta and mm -hmm. Instagram in our market. Um, so they reported that they're planning to drastically scale back uh, those shopping features. And eventually that shop tab will disappear from the app and trying oh. to shift to a, quote, simpler and less personalized version of its in-stream product display, whatever that means. Um, so, yeah, it's just it, interesting to kind of just see them They're They're kind of just trying to do whatever they can to uh, monetize Instagram. But it looks like they're having a little bit of trouble. Um, yeah. So that's kind of interesting. You know what? I don't know. What do you think? Hot take. Maybe Instagram should stop trying to steal what every other app is having success Ooh. with and strike <laughs> yeah. them up with their own ideas. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, Just that's saying. not what Just that's saying. not what that's not what uh Mark Zuckerberg not what likes do. to do. No, 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 no. No, no. <laughs> Let's go <laughs> to you next. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know that mine's as exciting necessarily, but Notion did recently <laughs> add a new feature called Team Spaces, which is going to make it a lot easier, I think, to get teams on board with Notion, which is one of our big challenges we can talk about later. But Team Spaces feature, you can check it out in their Notion's documentation if you're a Notion user trying to get your team on board. Nice. And then uh, my note today is actually about a different app that's not Twitter or Instagram, so shocker for me. Um, but Circle is like a community tool. I'm in a couple of Circle communities at the moment, and I find it to be a really great app. Um, like really good UI, seems really like easy to engage, but not um, like you're going to get sucked in and have to sort through a bunch of like, you know, junk to get to the value uh, in the communities I'm in. And they've announced that they're working on a course platform to add to the community one. So you'll be able to have a course with a community sort of like embedded in, which I'm really excited about um, because I know that I want to make a course one day, like that's in my future. And so I'm like, cool, I'm going to wait for Circle to launch this. And then that's probably what I'll use for my course in the future. <laughs> I'm super curious about that too, because we do use Circle for our membership, but our go. course is hosted in Notion, but sometimes we've talked about doing little micro courses. So I'm kind of curious mm. what the user experience looks like and kind of how it rolls out. I am very interested to hear that your course itself is hosted in Notion that is so meta, like meta and yes. you know the way I mean it. I'm not talking about Instagram anymore. <laughs> <laughs> they really yeah, it's... Yeah, <laughs> they, yeah, they really did. They really did. <laughs> but that's cool. Yeah. Let's get into talking about you and your business then, Marie. Uh, yeah. Give us the overview. D is what I said in the intro correct? What would you add to it? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, for the past almost three years, we've been running our course Notion Mastery inside of Notion. Uh, Notion Mastery is just one of our products, though. So we do offer, you know, consulting services and we've launched other courses in the past. But this is just the one that I think kind of ate our business and kind of took over in a way that we didn't really expect. So we sort of doubled down on it. And we've since um, hired employees as well, too. So now there's four of us working full time pretty much on this wow. course. So uh, 
kind of, yeah, took a big left turn that we we didn't expect a couple of years ago. We're like, well, I guess this is our life for a little while. So we might as well see where this goes. Yeah, That's super exciting that you've then grown a team around it. What roles did you decide to hire for? Because I know that's something that is really challenging for a lot of creators to oh, figure yeah. out. I know I need help, but like who and what exactly do I need help with? Yeah. yeah and I mean, how do we know like how to hire, how to delegate? Like I, I've mm -hmm. been working on my own for so long of... I don't know, 13 years, maybe I've been self-employed. Uh, I didn't know anything about how to how to delegate or how to hire or who even should be my first best next hire. Uh, but the first hire I did do started out as a virtual assistant, which it didn't take me long after working with her to realize, OK, she's much more than a virtual assistant. She has HR background. She's got operations mm -hmm. experience and she had run online courses before, which is very, oh, wow. very handy when someone understands those pieces behind the scenes. But I think she didn't enjoy being sort of in front of the business. Like she really enjoyed the behind the scenes stuff and the details work. I'm not, <laughs> not the details chick over here. <laughs> and so I just kept giving her more and more responsibility. It took a while to find our groove together and figure out like, well, how do I actually download everything that's in my brain to somebody else? Um, that was probably the biggest challenge I would say is like, how do you actually get that stuff that feels just instinctive and that you just do mm -hmm. every day and to, to get it documented. And so that was a big part of her responsibility is actually translating that. So hypothetically, I get hit by a bus, <laughs> the business and the course could go on without me theoretically. So um, yeah, wow. we kept increasing her responsibility. And eventually I, I gave her a full-time offer. Um, she said yes and gave away, you know, gave up other clients and stuff. And that was a huge first next step. Uh, then my husband came back to the company in only December. So, you know, nine months ago now ish. Uh, and then we just hired our fourth full-time employee that is our chief learning officer in January. So it's been an interesting, uh, interesting sort of increase. We're still a tiny team. We're all sort of like, you know, CMO, CTO, we all kind of mm -hmm. wear many hats, but it's four of us uh, now full-time. I'm interested That's about the, that process. Cause I know like as creatives, a lot of the times you really enjoy kind of holding all of the cards in your hand you feel like you have control mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to give that yeah. up sometimes and especially if you're trying to cultivate something very specific that's in your head and I would love to know more about your process of how you cultivate a team that like gets to know kind of like your style and can sort of mirror what you would have done in their shoes without oh, you yeah. being like oh they did that a totally different way that I wouldn't have done and sometimes in a bad way like you know you took that in a direction I wouldn't I don't want to go in so how do you yeah. create a, a team around you that like is you oh that's such a good question and obviously I only have my sort of limited anecdotal experience of that but sure. I, I think because Georgia, who's our you know chief chief of ops, if you will, very early on, I was seeing the way that she was replying to emails felt very aligned with the way that I was writing. So I could tell mm -hmm. that she was just taking initiative and she sort of had that instinct and it she knew that it mattered to me, kind of how do we leave people feeling when we send an email reply or you know someone a student feels frustrated because they can't find something. And I just really noticed the way she was replying was very in line with kind of how I would reply. So I think that's partly why. I wanted to make her that full-time offer was just, she was just showing so much initiative and it felt like there was a very strong values alignment. It probably took another six months to a year, maybe of us really working together before we actually defined some of those values and principles of like, what does it matter to us as a team? How are other people perceiving us? What are, What is the experience we want students to leave with? And that did really matter to us. And so I think I, I kept those conversations very open with her. And if I did see her reply in a way that I thought, oh, actually that, you know, I would have approached it this way. And in the beginning, you know, she asked a lot of questions. She's like, do you want to do X or do you want to do Y? And I'd be like, oh, great question. I'm glad you checked in with me. I'd like to do Y, but let's also do this. Things like giving coupon codes or, you know, scholarships mm -hmm. or things like that. And eventually just keeping lines of communication really open, defining things as you bump up against them and putting them into a standard operating procedure, a document, a principle, Obviously, we use Notion for everything. So every time yeah. we would just bump up against something, those little scripts and things would just make their way into Notion and sort of it became this internal knowledge base, which then makes it a lot easier when you bring in new employees. And so I think also I work from instinct. So the next time I bump up against someone and I see their skills shining and, you know, Kat, our chief learning officer, is a great example. She was a student 
but she'd show up on the office hours and she would show demos of her space. And also her camera was incredible. Her eye contact. She had all these things about the way she was presenting. I'm like, this woman knows how to present. She knows how to teach. She's got some skills. So I think, I, you know, I recognize these skills in other people. And I think that mm -hmm. would be amazing to have that level of quality in our presentations. I'm much more kind of slapdash. I can turn on the camera, show up live and, you know, run, run a live call. But it's not like a polished presented webinar or a training that's a little bit more formal like Kat can do. And I thought, imagine what we could do together if we sort of, you know, refined the edges and stuff. So part of it is just, I think, recognizing talent in other people and noticing those gaps and asking myself, like, can we work together? What are the things that matter to be similar on? And what are the things where I need to hire for the gap? And that was just something I've sort of kept in mind uh, and just fumbled my way through. I did make a couple hires that I think were really awkward and just like didn't work out. And you kind of trial trial people for you know three or six months, and you say like, this doesn't feel easy. We're missing the mark on communication. Maybe you've given someone a warning about something, and it just isn't quite hitting the mark. So I've definitely fumbled around and had those really awkward experiences too. But I think when you find those right people, you're like, you're so grateful because hiring is really difficult, and I don't think there's just a one size fits all way of hiring people. Um, and the other thing I'll add to this, too, is I've only recently been diagnosed with ADHD, which I think explains a lot <laughs> about what felt like a very chaotic working style. And so mm -hmm. being able to work with people that understand my unique limitations and strengths and being able to work with that, um, that for me, I think, was a, a sort of interesting challenge. And the diagnosis gave me a lot more information to work with and realizing, like, this is why I can sometimes be a bottleneck or why... I don't want you to feel bad for poking me five times to remind me to do that thing. Like these are real conversations we have to have at work to make sure that the team knows how to work with me and that they know how to get the best out of me and, and vice versa. Oh yeah. That's really interesting hearing that you actually hired on some people that it didn't work out and like, maybe you had to let them go or they, they chose to leave, but it does sound like a lot of getting the right people on the team or like getting the help you need is about, who you hire in the first place and what to look Big out time. for um, and putting the effort in there. Yeah. Yeah. And just like uh, recognizing what is it that, what is that that's needing improvement? What is it that, where are you mm -hmm. working toward? Like being clear about kind of what does this look like in a year from now? What can we envision? And then who are the people that are going to fill those gaps and, and kind of take you there and go further together? And I think what I noticed about the great hires is it, it takes, a little bit of time up front, of course, anytime you hire someone new, there's that upfront and there's training and there's just getting to know your processes. But then ultimately, I have way more time on my hands. And if you yeah. don't get to that point where you have way more time on your hands and you're always kind of managing, then I think that's where it takes the fun out of, of being a creator. So it's important to me that the team is very autonomous. I'm extremely autonomous. I'm off doing things. I need people who can make decisions, not hesitate. And I'd rather them do something and ask for forgiveness than ask for permission first. And so people that are comfortable with that. So I do think personality and values is a big, big part of you know, hiring the right fit. Honestly, you sounds like a really fun company to work for. I <laughs> hope so. <laughs> like that. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. I mean, um, you, I, you go. Well, I, I'll just add another piece of that on, on the fun part. Like that really matters to us is that mm. um, I want people to feel like they can't believe they get paid to do this work. And one of the things we love to do is give people the option of either a sabbatical or four day work week. And so one of our employees has a sabbatical model where it's seven weeks on one week off, seven weeks on one week oh. off. The other one does four day work week. And we give employees, you know, our two, our two full time employees, uh, you know, the ability to choose that. And it just, I think it creates just more of a work life balance and people are happy about the work that they're doing. We do profit sharing. And again, even though we're tiny, we want to make sure everyone feels really good and happy about the work that they're doing. Wow, I love that. Do you do a sabbatical or a four-day work week? You and or your I, husband as well? I feel like we're less structured about it. So we'll be like, oh, mm -hmm. let's do a spa day today, or like, oh, hey, there's nice. an opportunity for, yeah. for a trip or whatever. And we can decide to do that. So Perks we're of a running lot more flexible business. with it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Um, in there, uh, a while back you mentioned improvements and like what are we looking to improve? 
And so when we were talking before starting this episode, I mentioned that I wanted to talk about your funnel and like how your audience finds you, how you get them to purchase courses. And then if you were comfortable with it to talk about improvements you want to make and you were like, oh yeah, that's going to be much easier to talk that's about. That's the actually. easy thing to talk about. Yeah. yeah. So I that love that. <laughs> Let's give a quick overview of the, the funnel to start with and then honestly spend more time on that because I think people will get a lot of value from hearing what a creator at your level is thinking about and like what you're noticing mm. in how honestly what is a very successful system is working and how there's always more that can be improved with oh, it too. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. And, and um, I mean, even when I say like the funnel, I always just feel like your marketing is just a work in progress. It's just, it's yeah. never done. It's always, <laughs> there's always something to, to work on there. And so I can say like where things started, there was no conscious funnel. It was like, oh, I need to you know, get people knowing about this, start a YouTube channel. Like that's kind of how everything started was making videos on YouTube about Notion. And even that was a big push. Like that was a, a struggle for me. I was not comfortable mm -hmm. on video, like doing YouTube videos was kind of like the last thing I could imagine myself doing. I'm like, what am I doing? This is, this is madness. Uh, can I actually do this? And so, I just shipped a couple of videos. I committed to doing one video a week, every week for 12 weeks. I'm like that, at least I'll, I'll have something to show for it. And I can see if this actually works. And it didn't take long of even just doing a couple of weeks of videos. I think at the time there just wasn't a lot of notion YouTube content yet. And so I think it was just hitting those search terms very, very quickly. Like there just wasn't too much else out there. So YouTube became the very first kind of place that people would find out about me. And of course, the first thing I did was just added a ConvertKit link to uh, the profile and I would add it onto every uh, video description that I did and just said, hey, did you like this video? Want to learn more or check out my templates? Sign up for uh, my email list here. And I, I don't know exactly how long it took, but I feel like I hit 10,000 subscribers in a couple months. Like it was pretty fast for mostly starting from scratch, like it was kind of a new brand. I had other, um, you know, design communities and things that I'd been in. So my list was very, very tiny before that. So this just kind of catapulted things. And I thought, okay, there's some serious growth here. There's a major opportunity to do something with this. Um, so the funnel again, started with YouTube. That was sort of all I knew was like, make a video, add a call to action, send them to the list. Um, and it was kind of slapdash a little bit. Like I didn't have really planned out you know, I've got a webinar and then a link and then this and blog. Mm. So I feel like I was sort of throwing spaghetti at the wall. I did have blog posts. I would embed my YouTube videos inside the blog posts. I was experimenting with the calls to action. I also didn't know how deep to go in on Notion because my background had been doing web design and uh, course launching strategies for other creators. I was like, well, suddenly Notion is this left turn. Like, do I migrate my existing audience to that? Do I talk about different things and Notion just happens to be one of them? So I feel like I was in that limbo for a really long time and didn't really know how to even invite people to my list because I wasn't emailing people consistently. The only thing mm -hmm. I was consistent about was the YouTube videos. And that just seemed like that was the, the easiest way for people to find out about me. And so at some point, once I, the course was live, I just started sending people right from YouTube to the course landing page. I didn't even have an opt-in on the landing page. It was just buy the course or not. Keep watching me on YouTube. <laughs> buy the so course or ever. <laughs> there was so many like holes in the funnel. Like I probably wasn't capturing people that, you know, saw a video, checked out the landing page, weren't ready for it yet, and then would kind of disappear. So I, I didn't really do a great job of kind of nurturing that. I was just, it was like survival mode. You know, the effort it takes to record these really detailed YouTube videos and then prepping your space, recording it, editing it, suddenly all these new skills that I didn't know before. And I'm like, well, guess I'm a video editor now. Guess I'm a, <laughs> like, it just always feels like you're wearing so many hats, right? Um, and I'm happy to, you know, elaborate on any, any of that, but that's kind of how it started was like YouTube and then like, oh my gosh, I need to figure out this whole email thing. How do, <laughs> what do we do now that we have this course and we've got these blog posts and videos, how do we kind of weave it all together? So it's been a bit of a process to figure out how to actually really optimize ConvertKit too, to make sure that we're being smart and keeping people that are wanting to be in our orbit, but they're just not ready to buy yet. So, yeah, so you, you mentioned how in you're using kind of YouTube as the thing that drives them towards whatever your pitch is um, and where you're capturing these people. Um, what is what is strategy did you develop to get them interested in purchasing the template? Was it you kind of like wet their appetites in the video and it's like, and if you want more, 
check this out or is there some sort of like connection between the landing page itself? Like what, what did you find worked? Yeah, initially I would just, so one example is I would have a YouTube video that would show the thing and then I have a template that was reflective of what I was showing in the video. So the call to action mm. in the description would be like, hey, did you like this template? You can check it out here, sign up and get the template. Um, and we experimented with a bunch of things too, like sending people directly to a template link, sending them to an opt-in so they'd have to get the template link, even trying, um, we used to use Gumroad. I think once ConvertKit added their e-commerce, we switched over to ConvertKit, but it would just be a Gum Gumroad link, sometimes pay what you want to so uh, give people hmm. the ability to you know zero dollars five dollars whatever they felt it was worth and then we also tr experimented with things like um, at the bottom of the template there'd be a little link and it's like hey did you like this template you can apply this coupon if you want to upgrade to the course and so we experimented tons with what types of calls to action work what types of videos work better some of them you know definitely are stronger than others and just have more views or are more searched and so we would try to optimize those videos and the calls to action to be a little bit more relevant or specific to the thing that was in the video so uh yeah it's taken a while to figure figure some of those things out and i think we're always still kind of experimenting with that a little bit but uh generally speaking hey did you like this sign up check out the template over here on convertkit Am I right in thinking that the video was essentially you showing the template and how you created it so people could follow along and set it up themselves if they wanted, but like then also they could just buy a ready-made uh, or download kind a ready-made? Of. Yeah, like it, sometimes, for example, I would show a more advanced version in my space. Mm. And so I'm giving mm -hmm. a demo of like, you know, here's kind of what's possible with it. But if you just want to get started, there is a smaller, simpler version of it over here. And so people would, you know, be intrigued by the like, oh, that's where I could go with it if I just learned these basics and stuff. So um, some of the videos are a little bit more like, hey, here's how to work with this, you know, beginner template kind of thing. Um, so yeah, they're, they're all kind of different. There's a lot of experimentation happening <laughs> behind the scenes. Yeah, interesting. It, it, when you said you grew to like 10,000 subscribers quite quickly, you meant on the email list subscribers, yeah. right? Not YouTube subscribers. Yeah. Um, and that is awesome because I know that a problem that we have as YouTubers, as listeners will know, I am one also, um, is getting people off the YouTube platform without YouTube penalizing it for us ask for it too much and into our own ecosystem our email list where we can contact them later um and it really seems like this idea of offering an opt-in like a template directly related to the video has has gotten people interested but you also mentioned at the start that just even a simple want to know more about this got people signing up definitely yeah i think yeah. again i think there was just so much momentum around Notion at that time. Like mm. people were just hungry for that content. It's confusing. It's so open-ended. You can do anything with it. So what can you do with it? And there was just a, a real gap there, I think. So people were just like, okay, who's talking about this? Um, yeah. And if they stumbled upon my site, if they liked the other stuff I was writing about, and that's where I kind of realized I didn't want to only go so hard on Notion. So one of the things I did early on when I saw that the YouTube stuff was, was picking up was I did switch all of my positioning on my site to be like, Notion tips and tricks, you know, and I kind of switched everything mm -hmm, to Notion. Mm -hmm. But then I was like, oh, this just feels too narrow for me. Like, I don't like, yeah, be careful if you ask me about Notion. I could I could go on and on and on and I will. So you got to be careful. But there's so many other things. For me, Notion is just enabling me to do the stuff I really love to do. It's just a creative tool for me. So to only talk about it from a tips and tricks or how to perspective, I was like, teaching beginners notion is going to get pretty old pretty mm. fast. And mm -hmm. I'm much more interested in, it could say like being the experts expert. Like I want to show advanced people how to take it, like really push the limits on something or to think outside the box or to think strategically about how might we build this? How might we approach this? Like the problem solving piece. Um, but then also bringing my background to it, whether it's permaculture studies or my design background or knowing about online courses there's all these other things that inform why I approach Notion the way that I do. And so to kind of pull those away didn't feel like it made as much sense. I think it was really good to niche really hard right in the beginning. But then I was like, hold on, like, I'm just going to back up a little bit. Let's talk a little bit more like workflow, productivity, work-life balance, systems. That stuff is more interesting. And so I think zooming in early was really good. And then zooming back out and being like, no, no, I could bring back the other parts of my life and business that actually enrich 
my perspective on Notion and why it's different. And so that's something I've experimented with is like, what is the call to action on the email? What am I promising? And for a while, I didn't really know. And I wasn't sending those emails out consistently. So I just think it took me a while to figure out like, what is my message? And, and what do I talk about? Um, so I do encourage creators, you know, don't be afraid to experiment with your the wording, the phrasing, kind of how you talk about what you do and, and see what uh, forms actually convert better, right? Yep. So hearing you talk about this, um, so it seems, sounds like at first you were like really, really specific and then you kind of backed up and got more generic. Was that uh, driven by you worrying about, um, like you, you mentioned that you were worried about it being you know, putting all your chips in one basket and just because like that would get old real fast yeah. so is b is making your stuff a little bit more generic um based on just like you thinking about like making sure that you're not kind of like painting yourself into a corner uh or like what what what, what drives that decision is just like based on your interest or based on what your list kind of gave you feedback about what was interesting to them like what sort of motivates that 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 choice and also, yeah. how did the audience take it as well? Like, because yeah. they'd signed up for the Notion stuff initially, yeah. how, did, how did things happen when you started talking about things that weren't necessarily just Notion? Yeah, I think that is, that's exactly something that I was struggling with. It's like, wait, well, when they signed up, this was the promise, but then what is mm -hmm. this? And, you know, right. how does that work? And I already wasn't sending emails out enough, often enough to even know, like, how does this whole email thing work? I don't know. Who is my one reader? I was having like an existential crisis. Um, <laughs> I, have sure lot of, yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of creators can, can relate to that. Who am I? What does it all mean? Um, <laughs> I think what was interesting is like anytime I would tie in conversations around other things, I would get a lot of resonance and I get a lot of replies. And mm. so even the, like the permaculture awesome. stuff or I would like tease stuff on Twitter and, and whenever I just noticed that there just seemed like a bit of magnetism, like, Ooh, people seem really drawn to this idea and they're really engaged. I, I just realized that that stuff is going to make the notion stuff more relevant and richer that you will get the occasional people that are like, more templates or like, where's the template for this thing? You know, they, they want, they just want the, the really specific how to, but there's at this point, there's so much other notion content out there right now. And there's no shortage of beginner content. We know in I think every mm -hmm. creator market, the beginners are the most served market because anyone even just one step ahead can be serving the beginners. And so at some point, I just I had to make a choice around that is like, I don't want to just be giving out the same advice or templates that with a sea of other templates, it, it's much harder to stand out. Like, why are we not doubling down on our unique differentiator or the things that both Ben and I have worked in agencies, we've worked in the design world, like we've, we have other experience we can bring to this, why would we not be doubling down on that and coming at it from a different angle. So yeah, part of it is like, not wanting to put all your eggs in one basket, but also Ben and I have reinvented ourselves so many times over the years. Like we did the course creation thing. We had a software for that. Like we've gone through so many phases of business that I was like, you know what, if things don't work out with Notion, we can absolutely pivot and do something different. Like our consulting translates across different industries, I guess. And so part of it is hedging our bets a little bit and being like, yeah, Notion could sell to Salesforce. And we're like, maybe we don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> we can totally do that. But yeah, I think the language kind of gives you some optionality a bit to be like, okay, we're not the Notion company. We just happen to be consultants that this is our tool of choice. This is why all these other things that inform our perspective. So yeah, a bit of it is how do we stand out? How do we uh, hedge our bets a little bit and just make sure that we're being smart and, and diversified and can pivot and people wouldn't be like, whoa, that came out of left field. It's like, no, mm. this actually makes sense for who we are and what we do. I, oh, love, I love that viewpoint. I love that. Yeah. Just love all round from both me and Miguel. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. well, I was going to add, I was going to, I was, I wasn't trying to talk over you, but uh, I will. Um, so <laughs> I, uh, it, it kind of reminds me a little bit of like you hear stories about, you know, certain businesses that lean really hard on, on, on a certain tool or a certain idea. And then that tool or idea becomes less relevant for some reason, or it, mm -hmm. it, that tool decides to go in a direction that is antithetical to your plans. And then all yeah. of a sudden you're like, oh shit, like, you know, I have to sort of reinvent my whole business because they reinvented their whole business. Um, 
Oh, um, yeah. You know, you hear like, for example, to like a real sort of like basic example is you guys remember when like WhatsApp went down and like all the meta stuff went down for like seven hours. Oh, yeah. And then you heard the stories about like these businesses that like their business just ground to a halt because it's like this is 85 percent of my traffic is through whatsapp or, or, or whatever or through instagram. Or instagram yeah yeah so you know when you lean so hard on another service and then something happens with that service uh you know the lesson was like ooh, maybe we should diversify what we're partnering with um yeah. and you know what you know what what connects to our business for you know just for self-preservation of nothing else but also just what is you know you having more creative control over what you're doing um i think Yes, uh, I will say there are times where, for example, Notion launches a new feature or like a major new feature. And we're like, well, guess we need to update 80 percent of the course <sighs> oh, or, yeah. you know, that totally invalidates this thing. Or like now we, we need to learn that, make sure we know how we would approach that and then teach that and re-record or up, update lessons and stuff. And there are times where Notion might take a, the product in a certain direction or they release features when they're still buggy. And then we have to tell our students like, don't worry, it's not you. It's just Notion being buggy. Like that stuff does happen. <laughs> and then it does make you lose confidence sometimes. And you think, mm. whoa, okay, this is a moment where we need to ask ourselves hypothetically, if this type of thing doesn't change, are we still comfortable promoting this to a client or you know, a team of a hundred people that are, are paying us to train them on Notion? Or you're thinking, if we do this in a live training and something goes wrong because they didn't fix that, but like that is nerve wracking, right? So those things definitely do pop up every now and then. And, and I think they happen in cycles where you're like, why did they do that? And then you're like, okay, they fixed it. It works great now. It's no, better too, than before. Yeah. And you, yeah. you've got the roller coaster of, of SaaS. So yeah, that definitely does happen. And it's a risk for sure. Yeah, as a SaaS what company, I love we have that problem uh, on the yeah. other yeah. side. You know, <laughs> yeah. we, decide, we decide this feature you know is the pain. fundamentally, this fundamental feature is now going to work the opposite of the way it used to. Sorry about that. You know, and it's, you know, we don't just do that on a whim. It's like based on a lot of work and a lot of research. Yep. And then you, there's always still some people that are just like, change it back. We hate you. They're mad at so, you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Pitchforks are out. <laughs> Um, what I love and what you were saying about this like niche expanding out, um, you know, back again to focus on the experts. I love the confidence in, look, we've reinvented ourselves before. We know that we can make a business selling something or teaching something that people need to learn. Um, there's just a lot of freedom in the, like trusting yourself in that. I really, yeah. really like it. And so I just it's taken to so call that long. out. So long. It's taken so long to, <laughs> to build get to that, that point. Yeah. Or yeah, just to get to the point where you're like, yeah, I know that we'll be fine because mm -hmm, we've mm -hmm. we've made products like ebooks, courses, masterminds, coaching, like you name it. I have done every format, probably, <laughs> probably every format that you could deliver, except for maybe physical products. <laughs> that's the only thing I. Ooh, I so that's what's coming next. Yep. No. <laughs> Get your planners out. No. Um, so yeah, we've, we've tried everything. We've tried different formats. We've had success in different ways with different formats too. And, um, you know, Ben's a developer. He can build whatever the heck he can imagine. Like he loves tinkering on software and stuff. And I just feel like between client services, consulting products, we would just ship a different that. product. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's get into talking about some of those improvement ideas that you have for your funnel or like ways that you feel like it's not serving you right now, whether that's <laughs> in getting people to join your email list and sending the emails in mm. like sales for your course and where the traffic and where the students come from for that. Oh. What uh, is on your mind at the moment? There's like, it's so hard not to be like, oh man, there's just like a list of things that could be done. There's I'm sure it's in something. Notion, yeah, that you have a list. <laughs> oh, no, I mean, projects for every part of it too. Um, I mean, I can honestly say only in the last couple, maybe eight weeks, I've been sending emails consistently every week, Ooh! which I've never done before. Uh, I have hired some help with that as well too, because I have so many half-baked ideas or half-written emails that I just have trouble getting over the finish line. And, Maybe I can blame ADHD for that. But there's like no shortage of ideas and like just clips and just things I've written. And I needed someone who could help me weave those together and actually like I don't even have to schedule it. They're scheduled. They're gone. You know, and so nice. if I really want to make a change, I have to unschedule it, add the changes, but they're going to go out every single week. And so even just that consistency is very, very new for me. People would like sign up for a template, sign up for the list. And I'm like, you'll hear from me in 19 months, <laughs> which is not... <laughs> 
<laughs> not the way to do it. And so it's been a constant process of improving that, obviously. Most of my focus was on the behind the scenes of the course, getting the course ready, finalized, but then Notion would add a new feature. So I was constantly uh-huh. adding adding and kind of refining the behind the scenes. Like I wanted the course experience to be so good. I kind of put all my energy in that. And because sales were kind of coming in on autopilot anyway, I think because of the YouTube videos, I was able to be like, I'll do that later. Like that's a leak in the bucket that I can just worry about later. So for me, I think email funnels and strategy was the weakest link for sure. And I'm only starting to kind of, you know, plug those those holes in the bucket. Um, so right now, um, the consistency of, of the evergreen emails going out every week, not just Notion, but they are uh, productivity, operations, workflow. I will always include a Notion screenshot in there, like something really advanced or something interesting. So if I'm talking about a concept, I will show my version of kind of how that looks uh. in my space. It's like a, oh, whoa, that's neat, you know? So it's not a how-to, it's not beginner content, but they're like, I see what you can do with it. Um, mm-hmm. And so that's still kind of post funnel, if you will, it's like after people have signed up for the list and they're, they're, you know, hearing my voice. Um, but now we're trying to improve things like when we write an in-depth blog post or we make a YouTube video, making sure we have a companion blog post that's a slightly different format. It's not just a transcript of that YouTube video and slapping it on there, embedding the video. It's like, how can we be smart about that content now where you're, you're creating the pillar content and then asking what's the YouTube version of this, what's the blog post on Marie Poulin's website, what's the Notion Mastery blog version of this, and figuring out how all those things kind of tie together so that people are getting the right content, you know, when they want it, when they need it. So we're experimenting with that a little bit and being a bit smarter, I think, and uh, improving the search optimization on the sites. And um, one of the things we introduced as well is the Notion Mastery blog now. So that has its own distinct content. Anyone on the team can write content about that. They tend to be a little nice. bit shorter, way more Notion specific. But so figuring out that balance of, well, if people have come through me, they know me, but then we also have this Notion heavy content. Like it was a you know a bit of a process to figure out what is the the voice and what does the brand voice mean when people are coming to me personally versus they're curious about Notion and Notion Mastery. They know I'm part of that. So we had to do a little bit of work there to figure out, like, what does that look like? Who's all contributing here? Is this the voice of us, the team? Is it the voice of Marie? And then here are cats talking this week. So there was a little bit to figure out um, along the way. But yeah, figuring out what are all the different ways people find out about us, Notion specific, curious about Marie's work and online courses and the creator economy and workflow. Um, and then YouTube. And so these are sort of the different uh, channels. I will say a lot of people find out about us through Twitter as well. That's the channel that I'm nice. the most active on. Um, and then I use Instagram as like Marie's personal life behind the scenes. If you're really curious about just what my life looks like outside of Notion. And uh, I'm a little bit more maybe uncensored there and a little bit more more playful. I like that. I like hearing about a creator who's having success without having to post like a bunch of carousels or reels and things all the time. Cause I'm the same way. Most of my Instagram stories is my cats. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And, <laughs> yeah. I feel like I'm at a point. I'm lucky enough. I feel like I'm at a point where people are finding out about the course. It has really good search mm-hmm. engine traffic. I, I can maybe get away with things that maybe other creators might need to do a little bit more work there because I, I think I was able to sort of compound the wins from previous parts of my business, like other courses that I had run before in the designer world. So I've been able to get away without as much of like really conscious, well-designed funnels. But of course, now I'm going back and saying like, okay, there's no welcome sequence when someone joins a list. It's like, surprise, they'll get the next broadcast whenever. Like those are the little things where imagining what is one person's experience through my brand and that, you know, they're going to come through different, whether it's through Twitter and they oh, they see my pinned tweet, then they come to my website. I'm trying to think about what is the flow for different people and making sure that, yeah, when somebody signs up, they're they're not kind of just dropped in the middle of nowhere. And then the next thing they get is like a sales email or something like that. So I'm trying to right. be much more Imagine conscious of that. <laughs> exactly. So it's, yeah. there's no shortage of things that, that could be tweaked and fixed and optimized, but we're, we're every month we're just making these <laughs> small improvements. A little bit better. Yeah. yeah. It really sounds like the, cause you talked about expanding the team and like becoming notion mastery 
uh, as a company, right? Instead of just you as a as an independent creator. Yeah. And it's interesting to then think about what that means for the voice and the brand and all that, and how it feels for you as a creator who started this based on you know yourself uh, and for the way that changes and evolves. I think that's something that a lot of creators go through and it's like not often talked about to be honest yeah yeah and I think part of it was hiring people in a way were similar to me in vibe like I I know Mm. that everything is about you can trust that what's going to come out of them is going to be something you're on board with good vibes professional like I've just seen seen the way they hold themselves and the way they operate I know that having them on is going to make the whole business better like hire people that are better than you at at things that you know that's not my jam. That's totally her jam. The thing that would drain my energy is the thing that she could do in five minutes and be like, yes, and be so energized. So for, I think for me, managing my ADHD is about energy management and managing my dopamine. And so I'm very, very conscious of what tasks give and take my energy. And I think mm. I'm very conscious of that for my team, even if they're not diagnosed with ADHD or don't struggle with that, I'm very conscious of it. And so I want to make sure mm. that Georgia is doing the tasks that light her up that she, again, can't believe that she gets to do. So uh, in some ways, I project that onto my teammates. But I think it's for everybody's benefit that everyone should feel, for the most part, like you're pretty freaking stoked about what you're doing. Yes, we're all going to have to do stuff we don't really want to do. But then ultimately, too, we do have to agree, okay, when we're replying to a student or whatever it is, how we show up in our blog posts, what is the vibe? And is there a unifying thing? And I think I think humor is is a big part of kind of how we operate. Like Kat and I laugh a lot. We laugh when we're planning our presentations. We have no problem like throwing out little jokes when we're doing a training because it should be fun. And I think learning can be very stressful and learning software, like nobody likes reading software documentation <laughs> unless you've got some really amazing writers on your team that can make it really human, really engaging, really fun. And I think that is a challenge. And so... Uh, I think it matters to us that we can bring a level of levity and playfulness to yeah. the stuff that might seem really technical. And so you'll, I think, see that across most of our Twitter accounts, whether it's using funny GIFs as we're writing about something about Notion and things like that. So again, we keep updating our internal uh, guidebook of kind of like how who we are, how we operate, how do we uh, bring the brand forward? And I do think, you know, humor and uh, and levity is a big part of that. Love that. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of that. I'm, I might butcher it, but it's like this uh, famous Steve Jobs quote about doesn't make sense to hire smart people and then tell them what to do. You hire smart yeah. people so they can tell you what to do. Like you <laughs> you lean on people's uh, expertise and the things you never would have thought about because they're a different person and they look at something differently than you. And why would you want to hire three U's? Like that's, that's kind of pointless. I mean, unless you're just looking for grunt work. I think that's a a huge misconception too. And I think I thought that at the beginning too, like, oh, if only I could multiply myself, everything would be easier, right? I think we have a tendency to think that. Uh, And it can be tempting to hire someone that's maybe a little too close to your skill set. But I think again, hiring, hiring Georgia, like, if I never looked at another spreadsheet again, I'd be super happy like for Georgia <laughs> to go in there and deal with the numbers and even setting up all the convert kit stuff like she does that stuff and she loves that stuff and so I'm like yes thank you like there's an element of you like the detail work that drains me great like you go off and you do, do it the then. stuff that yeah. you love to do yes yeah yeah oh man that is uh, this is I love this conversation I could talk <laughs> I could talk about it for a long time I'm yeah, you, uh, Marie, your your energy is infectious, and um, oh yay. yeah, yeah, we're we're really we're really glad that you came on the show and talked with us. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, for me. and we uh, didn't let you talk much about Notion itself. So for anyone who wants to hear Marie talk about that, <laughs> then you should go follow her on her her own channels, and um, we'll put her Twitter on screen right now, um, and it'll be linked in the show notes as well. It's just a name, Marie Poulon. And or Poulin, as I think I heard you pronounce it. I'm trying to put a French <laughs> in on it. Um, <laughs> yeah, you can find links to her website, all the things that we talked about uh, here in this episode. And I also want to point you towards a case study that we've written on the ConvertKit blog that shares more details about Marie's business and specifically how she uses ConvertKit as well. Um, I'm not going to read this URL out for the audio version. So you'll just have to click the link in the show notes for that, but go check it out if you want to see that in more detail. Yeah. Thanks so much for, for everything you shared today, Marie. It's been super Absolutely. useful and great to get these behind the scenes insights.
anytime. Awesome. Well, we're going to take a break next week, folks, from the Future Belongs to Creators because we need to do some planning ourselves to make sure that we've got more great creators lined up like Marie, like we had Kay last week. Uh, so we will see you in a future week. But thanks for joining us today. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.